Hello everyone and welcome to this video tutorial on misrepresentation in contract law. A misrepresentation is a form of statement made prior to the contract being formed. If you recall, we've touched on this already when we studied express terms. And in express terms, we looked at sometimes a pre-contractual statement will be classed as a term and then a breach of that will lead to a claim in breach of contract. But if a pre-contractual statement is not classed as a term, it's actually classed as a representation. If that representation turns out to be false, then the claimant can sue in misrepresentation, which is what we're going to look at today. A misrepresentation is a false statement of fact or law, which induces the representee to enter a contract. Where a statement made during the course of negotiations is classed as a representation rather than a term, an action for misrepresentation may be available where the statement turns out to be untrue. And we can see here that a misrepresentation makes the contract voidable, which means that if something untrue has been said to you um, in the, the run up to the negotiations, the contract's still valid unless you sue in misrepresentation and you avoid it. Remedies for misrepresentation are rescission and or damages. And the law relating to misrep is mainly common law, but we're also going to have a look today at the Misrepresentation Act, which provides some further information on it. In order to prove that there's been a misrepresentation, we have to prove these three requirements. Firstly, there must have been a false statement of fact. Secondly, this statement induced the other party to enter the contract. And thirdly, the type of misrepresentation has to be determined. We're going to see that there's three types of misrep, innocent, negligent and fraudulent. And the type of misrep is important because it helps us to determine what remedies are available to the claimant. First requirement for proving misrepresentation is false statement of fact. A misrepresentation as to future intention is usually not actionable for misrepresentation because it's not going to be a statement of fact. And that's illustrated in the case of Edgington and Fitzmaurice. Of this case were that company directors were raising money by stating that they were going to use this money from investors to expand the business. In actual fact, their real intention was to use the money to pay off company debts. So their statement was fraudulent misrepresentation of fact. Now, what this case is telling us is that usually if you say that you are planning to do something in the future, that is not usually a false statement of fact because your plan of what you're going to do in the future is not a fact. It might change. However, in this case, it was a misrepresentation. And the reason for that is that it was a willful lie. What these company directors were doing was they knew for sure what they were going to do with the money and they deliberately lied about it. The first requirement for proving misrepresentation is that there's got to be a false statement of fact. So a misrepresentation as to future intention is usually not actionable for misrep because it's not a statement of fact. Meaning that if a person says what they're planning to do in the future, usually that's not a misrepresentation because your thoughts, your plans, what you might do tomorrow, they're not fact. But if we have a look at the facts of Edgington and Fitzmaurice, we'll see a slight exception to that. So here, company directors were raising money from investors by saying that they were going to use the money to expand the business. But in fact, that was just a lie. Their intention from the outset when they were collecting the money was to pay off the company's debt with it. They were not planning to expand. Now, in this particular case, the statement was held to be a mis misrepresentation because it was a willful lie. So our principle here is a statement of future conduct or intention is not usually a misrepresentation of fact unless we can tell it was a willful lie. They knew from the beginning that they were not going to do what they were saying. 
But in general, if I were to say something like, I'm going to mark your essays tomorrow, in general, that would not be a false statement of fact, because it's not a fact. It's what I'm planning to do in the future. If, however, I said to you, I'm planning to mark your essays tomorrow, but in my head I was thinking, haha, I'm not, um, I'm going shopping, then that could be a false statement of fact. So it has to be a willful lie to meet uh, that requirement. One thing to consider when looking at requirement one, false statement of fact, is to consider opinions. Because a lot of the time in negotiations for a contract, um, a party might give their opinion on something. Now, by definition, an opinion is not a false statement of fact. It's just an opinion. It's just a thought. So it won't generally um, be actionable for misrepresentation. So in Bissett and Wilkinson, we had an owner of a farm and he had never used his farm for keeping sheep. But he stated to a buyer that he believed it would support approximately 2,000 sheep. Um, and it, it didn't hold anywhere near that many sheep. Um, and so the person who bought the land was trying to sue in misrepresentation. But the claimant was unsuccessful because the court said that this comment about the 2,000 sheep was simply a statement of opinion. It wasn't a fact. So a false statement of opinion is not a misrepresentation. So be careful when you're looking at scenarios. Are they presenting something as a fact or are they saying it's just an opinion? I think, in my opinion, words like that might suggest that, that it's not a fact that they are representing. It's important for misrepresentation that the misrepresentation must be made by one party to a contract to the other party. So we've not got a third party or an agent involved. The statement was directly from this party to the other. And that's illustrated in the case of Payman and Lanjani. It's also important that the misrepresentation is made before or at the time of contracting. And this is a very logical rule to have, because if the misrepresentation was made after the contract was formed, then clearly that wasn't uh, what induced the contract in the first place. And that's illustrated in the case of Roscola and Thomas. So you can see that the facts here were that Roscola purchased a horse from Thomas. After the contract was complete, Thomas represented that the horse was, quote, sound and free from vice. And this turned out to be untrue, but it was made after the deal had already been concluded. So it wasn't actionable in misrepresentation. So the misrep must be made before or at the time of the contracting. Silence or non-disclosure will not amount to a statement, so it can't be a misrepresentation because it's clear that there must be some kind of positive conduct to constitute a statement. And that's illustrated in the case of Smith and Hughes. And our claimant here purchased a quantity of what he believed was old oats after he'd been shown a sample. Turned out that the facts were new oats, and the claimant wanted the oats for horse feed, and so these new oats were of no use to him. Now, the seller who was selling these oats and showed the sample realised that the claimant was making a mistake about what he was looking at, but said nothing. Now, although that does seem a bit dishonest, remaining silent doesn't amount to a misrepresentation because it's not a false statement. So we need a false statement for it to be a misrepresentation. Once it has been established that a false statement of fact has been made, then it's necessary for the representee to demonstrate that the false statement induced them to enter the contract. The first case that we've got on this is Atwood and Small. And in this case, the claimants purchased some land from the defendant for £600,000. Now, the claimant's accountants and directors checked all of the accounts and reports and said that they were accurate. And that meant that the claimant was unable to rescind the contract um, when they turned out to be false because they'd not relied on the misrepresentation. So Atwood and Small is showing that you need to look closely and see, OK, the false statement was made, but did they rely on it? 
or did they check for themselves and they themselves have made a mistake? Still on the same issue of inducement, we've got the case of Jeb Fasteners. And in this case, the claimants acquired a company because they wanted the directors from the company. They then tried to rescind the contract on the basis of a misrepresentation made about uh, the accounts of the business. But their claim failed. And the court said that the misrepresentation about the accounts had not played a real and substantial part in inducing the claimants into the contract because their main reason for entering the contract was they wanted the directors. They weren't really interested in the accounts. It was the directors they wanted. So you've got to look closely at, was that definitely the real and substantial reason for them entering into the contract? Once it's been established that you've got a false statement of fact, which did induce the contract, you then have to decide what type of misrepresentation it was. Was it innocent, negligent or fraudulent? And you can see that the reason for deciding which it is will impact what remedy is available to the claimant. An innocent misrepresentation is a statement which is made with reasonable belief in its grounds. So this means that there was a false statement, but it was made honestly. The person honestly believed it to be true. They weren't negligent. And therefore, the main remedy for this is rescission, which means that we void the contract. So for an innocent misrep, you only get rescission. However, you can request damages instead of rescission under Section 2.1 of the Misrep Act. But for innocent, you can't have both. It's usually rescission or damages instead under Section 2.1. The second type of misrep is negligent misrepresentation. And there are two types of negligent misrep under the common law, Headley, Byrne and Heller, and under the Misrepresentation Act. In Headley, Byrne and Heller, it was held that you can claim damages for a negligent misrepresentation as long as these three things apply. Firstly, the party making the statement has specialist skill. There's proximity between the parties. And thirdly, the party making the statement is aware that the statement will be relied on. Because there's three requirements to prove here for Headley, Byrne and Heller, that makes it a little bit trickier to prove you've got a negligent misrep. It is possible and it's easier to prove you've got a negligent misrep if you use the Misrepresentation Act. And Section 2.1 states that we don't need to prove a special relationship if we use this act rather than Headley Burn. All you have to do is show that there's a misrepresentation which results in a contract and the claimant suffers loss. And it's preferable to use the act rather than Headley Burn. But whether you use Headley or the act, your remedies here are damages and or rescission. The final type of misrep is fraudulent, and this is the worst type of misrep. It has its origins in the tort of deceit, and it comes from the case of Derry and Peak. And Lord Herschel defined fraudulent misrep as making a statement which is either knowing it to be false without belief in its truth, or recklessly careless as to whether it being true or false. So in this situation, it's usually that the person making the statement is deliberately lying in order to induce the contract. And remedies for a fraudulent misrep are rescission and damages. This example of a fraudulent misrep case is the Spice Girls and Aprilia. And in this case, the Spice Girls signed a sponsorship deal to um, promote these scooters, Sonic Spice scooters. And Jerry left the group and the scooter company refused to pay. And the Spice Girls were trying to sue for their unpaid fees. But the Court of Appeal said that the group knew that Jerry was leaving before they signed the contract, and therefore they were guilty of fraudulent misrepresentation. And damages and costs of a million pounds were awarded to Aprilia. To summarise then what we've seen on misrep, that there are three requirements. Firstly, you need to prove there was a false statement of fact. Secondly, you need to show it induced the contract. And thirdly, you need to determine was it fraudulent, negligent or innocent. 
And remember, it's important to determine whether it's fraudulent, negligent or innocent in order to decide whether rescission and or damages will be available.